When I was a kid, we'd play this board game. You'd, you'd spin the dial and move your little car around the board and you get these pig people and put them in the car. It was the game of life. Of course, I got a little older and discovered that life is no game. It can be really serious. So how can you be grounded in life? Last time we talked about hope, this time life. Thanks for joining us. You're part of Grounded. Well, good morning and welcome to Grounded. Great to have you here and thank you for joining us. We are in Knoxville, Tennessee. Knoxville, the birthplace of Mountain Dew, which has provided dentists from sea to shining sea with a steady revenue stream from that day to this day. On a brighter and perhaps, perhaps a healthier note, uh, Knoxville is also the home of the University of Tennessee. University of Tennessee is the home of Neyland Stadium, which can fit 109,000 people inside its confines. Neyland Stadium is the seventh largest stadium by capacity in the world. You get more people in there than you can in the Melbourne Cricket Ground or Wembley Stadium in Great Britain. So friend of mine, been with us on several It Is Written mission trips. He's a physician, a respected sort of a fellow. He was a mischief maker when he was a kid. He's written a book about his life and you won't stop laughing or maybe you won't stop being amazed if you read the book. When he was a kid, his mother set him out to grab a, 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 a large basket of tomatoes. He bumped into a friend and then they saw just over there a big house, the neighbor's house, a big white wall. He said to his friend, I bet you I can throw this tomato and hit the wall of that house. His friend said, bet you can't. He said, oh, watch this. And with one great heave, boom, got it first time. That tomato splattered on the wall of the neighbor lady's house and started to slide down. That white was turning red. His friend laughed until tears came out of his eyes. He said, let me have a try. By the time those boys were done, if I remember correctly, 40 pounds of tomatoes had been hurled at the white wall of the neighbor lady's house. That boy was punished. He wishes he'd been grounded. Time to pray. Grounded is a five-part series. This is part four. We're praying together. Join me. Our Father in heaven, thank you today for Jesus. Thank you for the hope that's in the Bible. Thank you that we might be grounded. Bless us. Lead us, we ask you. We thank you as we pray in Jesus' name, amen and amen. To recap, nope, that's not right. God thought of everything. He absolutely thought of everything. He made a perfect world. He created human beings and put them in this perfect world and then gave us the capacity to think and feel and act. He gave us agency. He gave us the ability to love and to be loved. But life has got away from us just a little bit. Right now, 56% of the world's population live in cities. They say that within a few years, that number's gonna jump to 70%. What that means is that more and more people have moved away from nature and are dwelling in concrete jungles. Studies show, studies show that being outside in nature, just being in nature is good for you. It's relaxing, it reduces stress, it relaxes, uh, reduces cortisol levels, muscle tension, heart rates, all these things that are associated uh, with cardiovascular disease, just being in nature helps with that. There's a connection between being in nature and increased life expectancy, better sleep quality, reduced cancer risk. You move into a city, life is faster, no one ever referred to the countryside as the rat race. What we know, cities or otherwise, is that life is not just stressful, but increasingly stressful. The pandemic ratcheted stress levels up for absolutely everybody. A Harris poll reported that most Americans are experiencing, and this is a direct quote, overwhelming stress, most. Right now, we're dealing with the, the hangover from the pandemic, financial stress. Americans are reporting that even the war in Ukraine is stressing them out. 
The American Psychological Association says that stress levels in this country are higher than they have been for many years and they are worsening and that's not good. So what can you do about stress? Here are some suggestions from the Mayo Clinic. Mayo says, get active. That's good. Eat a healthy diet. That's good. Avoid unhealthy habits that will reduce your stress rate. Mayo Clinic says, to reduce stress, meditate. Now, they're not talking about biblical meditation. This is the Mayo Clinic. They say, laugh more. That's funny. They say, connect with others. Assert yourself. To reduce stress, try yoga. Now, Mayo Clinic may say that. I say otherwise. Uh, yoga is Hinduism. That's all it is. It is a Hindu religious practice. You may not think so, but it is. So when you are trying yoga to reduce your stress level, you have walked into what is simply Eastern mysticism. So me and Mayo Clinic, we're going to diverge on that one. They do say get enough sleep, keep a journal, uh, get musical and be creative. That may increase the stress level of others if you get musical, but maybe not. Seek counseling. Most of those things pretty good. What's interesting is what they don't put on the list. A lot has been written, even studied, regarding faith and stress or faith and stress relief. There is a clear connection, and here's why. When you know the God of the universe, you know that your life is now in his hands. There is not a day dark enough to blot out the light of Jesus when you believe you have salvation. When you believe that come what may, you are going to live eternally. That does not make you blasé or lackadaisical. That gives you hope and it releases your stress. One day, Jesus is coming back to this world. It does not take away stress. And in fact, you don't want to live entirely without stress. But the fact is, when Jesus comes back, the headaches and hassles of this world are going to be gone, knowing that will reduce your stress. You know God. You know how this thing ends. You know that eternity stretches before you. That knowledge will carry you through a lot that this world throws at you. Let's look at what the Bible says. This is the Word of God. Isaiah 26 and verse 3. It says, You will keep him or her in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Look at that. Perfect peace peace. Where else are you going to get that? Isaiah 32 verse 17 says, and the work of righteousness shall be peace, the effect of righteousness, quietness and assurance forever. Romans 8 verse 1, there is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus, to the one who walks not after the flesh, but after the spirit, no condemnation, your stress level just started to melt. Psalm 119 verse 165, Great peace have they who love your law, and nothing causes them to stumble. Jesus said, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world gives, give I unto you. Peace. You know Jesus, he comes into your life, he brings peace, and this will begin to drive the stress away. Then Philippians 4 and verse 7, it says, the peace of God, which surpasses understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. But God took this a step further. Even way back at the beginning, God knew everything that you would need. He knows it all. He planned ahead of time for this. In the beginning of time as we know it, God spoke to the darkness and he said, Let there be light. And there was light. On the second day of creation week, he created the atmosphere. Day three, dry land, seas, plants, and trees. Day four, the sun, moon, and stars. Day five, sea creatures and birds. Day six, animals and human beings. All done. Almost, but not quite. There was still another day. And the Bible says, and on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had made. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the Sabbath day, the seventh day, and sanctified it. Because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. 
God gave a day to the human family. And don't tell me you don't like holidays. You do. In the United States, 11 public holidays a year, at least for federal employees. There's a whole raft of them. Start with New Year's Day, and then the 11th one is Christmas Day, and the newest one, Juneteenth. If you think 11 is a lot, then think about Nepal, 30. Sri Lanka, 25. Myanmar, what used to be Burma, 32 public holidays a year. No, I don't know either how they get anything done, but I'm sure there are few people complaining. Rightly understood what you can do in the United States is take your 11 public holidays and add to them 52 more because God has given you a day off every week back at creation. God gave the Sabbath to the human family. The reason so God and human beings could spend uninterrupted time together. God said, build a sanctuary so that I may dwell among you. And this was God saying, I want time. In fact, he needs time with us. And we need time with him. There are other reasons too. But that's a key. Because we worship a personal God. Somebody who actually wants to know you and spend time with you. Do you think God knew that after 6,000 years of human history, things down here might be a little stressful? Oh, yes, he did. Did he know we'd be busy? Sure, he knew that. Did he know that, that just life would tend to place huge demands on people? Yes, God knew that. He knew way ahead of time what we would need. And so he built it in. He wove it into the fabric of life. In fact, he went further than that. He enshrined it in his law. Look at this in Exodus chapter 20, starting in verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor into all of thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it you shall not do any work. You, your son, your daughter, your manservant, your female servant, even a stranger, or that even your cattle rather, or a stranger who comes within your gates. Why is that? For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So this is not just an idea. This is God baking something into the human experience. God says, a day away from the stress of this world. In fact, Mark 2, Jesus says, the Sabbath is a gift. It was made for the human family. So as I tell you about God, God planned ahead of time for your well-being. He thought about your mental health, your spiritual health. God thought of you and he said, this is what they need. This is what she needs or he needs. This is something that will be a blessing. God thought about time off and he thought about you. This is Jesus saying, come to me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. This is without a doubt, after salvation, the best offer you have ever had. A day unencumbered to spend with God, sans distractions, you and God, 24 hours locked in. And look what God says, because this day comes with promises. Isaiah chapter 58, this is powerful. If you turn your foot away from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord, honorable, and shall honor him, not doing your own ways, nor finding your own pleasure, nor speaking your own words. Oh, this gets good. Then you shall delight yourself in the Lord, and I will cause you to ride on the high hills or the high places of the earth and feed you with the heritage of Jacob your father. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. How awesome is that? In a world that moves at warp speed, God is saying, take some time out. He mandates, take some time out. You need to rest. Turns out our bodies actually function scientifically on a seven-day cycle. Now, you've heard of the circadian rhythm. 
That's the 24-hour cycle our body works on, regulated in large part by light and dark cycles. There's another cycle. A lot of the body's biological processes are governed by a circuseptin rhythm, a seven-day rhythm, a seven-day cycle. This means you are actually created, designed to function according to the seven-day cycle. God knew that's why he enshrined the seven-day week, and he said you get to the end of that week. Ezekiel referred to the six working days. And God said at the end of that week, there's time out. God actually set an example for you. On the first seventh day, God rested. Jesus set an example for you. What did he do? Luke chapter 4 says Jesus came to Nazareth where he'd been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. Now, someone's going to say, well, Jesus was a Jew. This was for Jews. Ima imagine that, right? God saying, I've got a real good blessing just for the Jews. Hard luck for you Gentiles. That's not what God said. There were no Jews in the Garden of Eden when God created the Sabbath. There were no Jews for about 1,500 years while God's people kept the Sabbath. The Bible says that the Sabbath was made for man, Greek, anthropos. It was made for humankind. It was made for all of us. And the only reason we have a seven-day week at all is because of creation. It's the only reason. Now, down through time, some countries have tried to, try to modify that. After the French Revolution, the atheist French government introduced a 10-day a week. You work for nine days and take the 10th day off. How well do you think that went over? Not well. It didn't work. It fell apart. They reverted back to the seven-day week. Interesting. The reason they did that was because of the religious origins of the seven-day week. 1929, Soviet Union tried the same thing. They went to a five-day week. Everybody kind of got a different day off. That didn't work either, and it didn't last long. Uh, here's what we know. We know that you cannot improve on God's design. You just can't do it. And in a world where things are upside down, where faith in God is declining, skepticism is rising, paganism and evolutionary theory seem to be taking over, consider this. In the book of Revelation, you come to a place where there is a crisis in earth's last days. And God says in the context of this thing, I saw another angel. This is, this is John writing under the inspiration of God. I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to them that dwell on the earth and to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him because the hour of his judgment has come. And notice this. And worship him who made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. That's a call to worship the creator. And God asks us to do that by remembering the Sabbath day to keep it holy. The Sabbath is a barrier against skepticism. If you are keeping in mind that there is a God and he is the true God, you want to know that God and you keeping the Sabbath every week, week after week, you're acknowledging there's a creator. Jesus has claims on my life. Man, I got a question. I think it's an obvious one. Why isn't everybody talking about this? But this is the only commandment that begins with the word remember. It's the one that most people are happy to forget. You want to be grounded in life. This life that's coming at you at a million miles an hour, it doesn't have to jolt you out because you can work in partnership with God. You can walk arm in arm with God. The Sabbath was given you by God for that reason. He thought of everything, which is why, which is why way back in the beginning, he built a release valve into the very seven-day week itself. Time for you to spend with your maker. Time away from distractions and the stuff that'll drag you down. And you don't want to make the mistake of thinking the Sabbath is to be your only time with God. You don't want to do that. We'll talk more about that in just a moment.
First, I'm going to ask Wes Peppers, my friend and colleague, if he'd take a moment out of his busy schedule, spend a few minutes here talking about questions and answers. What have you got? Great to see you, Pastor John. Greetings to everyone. It's so good to see you here. Just a couple of things before our questions that we want to remind you about the study session following this session on itiswritten.tv. Pastor Eric Flickinger, myself, will be going through an extra study, so please do join us for that. Also, you can watch the archives of these programs on YouTube and Facebook right away. They'll also be later on It Is Written TV and the archives there. Our free offer this morning is God's Eternal Sign, written by Pastor John, and you can get that by going to grounded.study and registering yourself, and that will be emailed to you on the next day following the meeting. So be sure to get your free offer, God's Eternal Sign. There's also a donate button. If you'd like to help us create more programs like Grounded, you can donate there to It Is Written. So if the Lord leads you to do that, make sure you know that it's there. Also, we have an It Is Written website. We're promoting every program. And to, today is itiswritten.com, our flagship website. And you can go there. There's a number of resources and different things that you can access. And Pastor John, we have some mission trips as well coming up. Amen. You can access those there. And we're going to be going to a number of places next year, including Cuba, Philippines, and many other places. So we hope you would consider joining us on one of those mission trips. Change many lives, including your own. That's right. Yeah. All right, we're going to jump to our questions here. Our first one comes from Daniel. He says, how do I experience the fullness of the Holy Spirit as the Bible speaks about? Oh, I'd love to tell you you can do that instantly, but you probably cannot. He, he, here's what I mean. The Bible says this and makes you an amazing promise that if you then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask? You want to experience the fullness of the Spirit of God? Number one, ask that God will give you a spirit. Number two, make more room in your life for God. You, you, you shouldn't be hanging on to God and hanging on to sin. So the more you know Jesus, the deeper you'll go in your relationship with Jesus. That's why I said you won't experience the fullness right away. You're going to grow in this and grow in this and grow in this. So come to God, ask for that gift. Ask every day. Most people are not asking every day. You receive more of Christ and grow and grow and keep on growing, and you will experience the fullness of the Spirit of God. All right, our second question is from Kendra. What are the components to bring unity and harmony to God's church that we read about in Acts chapter 2? Wow. The components to bring unity and harmony. Yeah. yeah, let's talk about that for a week. Simple. If people would learn to set self aside and pray for God's will to be done. Secondly, if people will start to, do, to, to get more involved in others and less involved in themselves. I'll tell you this, if you talk about the church, if you find a church that's arguing, you have found a church that's not working. So when you get involved in mission and evangelism and sharing Jesus and serving your community, you will argue less because you will not want to argue. You will have discovered a greater purpose. Pray for unity. Put self aside. Don't strive for the supremacy. And get busy serving others so that your, com your community of faith is actually making a difference in your community and you'll see some unity. But as long as people want to sit around and navel gaze and fuss and strive and you know, idle hands of the devil's workshop, true in church. When you've got a slew of people who are idle, eventually, sooner rather than later, you're going to have complications. It can happen in the book of Acts. It can happen again, can it? It will happen again. That's it must right. happen again. God's right. simply waiting for people who get on the program. That's right. That's right. All right, number three, there seems to be a conflict between let God do it in you and versus me doing something about it myself, okay. how do I find the right balance? Yeah, okay, so there is a, you're, you're, you're a drinker, let's say, or were a drinker, you're walking down the street, there is a bar up there. If you say, God, uh, please save me from this alcohol while you open the door and walk in, you, 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 haven't, you haven't learned, you haven't learned. But if you say, God, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to purpose in my heart to walk past the, the door of that bar. I feel like I'm so weak I won't be able to, but I'm trusting you to provide the strength. Now, you are giving God your will. You're asking God to provide the power, but you are cooperating with God. 
There's a cooperation. That's not works. Don't say that it is. That's faith in action. Faith works, if you understand this thing correctly. So you give God your will and you recognize 100% it's His power, His ability, but you are cooperating with God by, ooh, someone's going to pick me up for this, by doing what you're capable of doing. You understand what I mean? So, so, ooh, that's not a good example to share. I'll just stick with the alcohol example. You have purposed in your heart not to drink. So rather than keep a liquor cabinet full of booze, you're going to toss it in the trash or pour it down the toilet. That's what you can do. But then you are trusting that God will provide you with the power and the go forward to walk in his way. The gospel is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Let Jesus live his life in you. There are some things that, that, that you'll do, though, because it's common sense and it enables God to work. Amen. How do I know if I should be rebaptized? What's the earliest age a person could be baptized? There's two questions. The earliest age, there's no earliest age. Well, the earliest age is when a child, a person, is able to have a meaningful personal relationship with God. That's the age. Now, that's going to differ from person to person, but it shouldn't be especially old. Rebaptism is a personal thing. It's a biblical thing. How will you know? I hate to say this. You'll know. If you're not sure, speak to the pastor or speak to somebody you trust and say, this is what I'm thinking. There might be something you're not thinking about. But it's a good thing to be thinking about when it's necessary, it's necessary. When it's not, it's not. So do talk to God. You're on the right track. All right, Connor has our last question. Can you share a personal experience in your life where you were in a slump with God and he brought you out of it? Um, no. I mean, no. Um, I don't have a story like that, actually. Although everybody has their ups and downs. Everybody has ups and downs. Um, I, I can't think of anything off the top of my head where I can say I had bottomed out spiritually. I remember speaking to the pastor who baptized me, and he said that he was, even in his ministry, flat. It was like the, 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 the fizz was no longer there. He, he just wrestled with that. But what he said is he just hung in there with God. What you don't do is trust your feelings. What you don't do is trust what you can see. You trust in God and you believe in God. So if you're feeling a little flat in your experience, take the Bible, read it, and believe that God is speaking to you. Read the promises and say, they apply to me. If you're, if you're weak, if you're stumbling and bumbling, that's a horse of a different color. You may need a different approach. But claim the promises of God, read the word of God, internalize it, and remind yourself every day, by faith I know I'm a child of God, and do not let what you see or feel indicate otherwise. Amen. Well, thank you so much for submitting those questions online. You can go to grounded.study. It's not too late to submit a question, so please do that. And if we don't answer it on the program, we'll either give you an email answer or we'll answer it on our Lineup Online program, which we often do. Amen. All right, we'll see you back in just a bit. Amen. Thank you very much, Wes. Imagine if you took faith in God seriously, and if you took the Word of God seriously, particularly when it talks about Sabbath rest. Imagine that. Imagine if you chose not to work. Imagine if you put things aside. Imagine if you put your devices aside, except for perhaps if you, you absolutely needed them. What if you turned in the direction of God and turned away from the secular? You ask people everywhere if they like the idea of a day off. Oh, sure. Ask Christians, do you like the idea of the Sabbath? Absolutely. Who would say otherwise? But where it gets complicated is when you ask people about doing it God's way. Look at what the Bible says. The seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. You know, that's, that's really clear. So when you open up the Bible and consider doing it God's way, what does the Bible say? I'd like to look with you in Luke chapter 23 because this is where it gets a little sticky with people. Luke chapter 23, let's go there. I may have to open my Bible here. You might see it on the screen. Luke chapter 23, and towards the end of the chapter, here we go. We're speaking about Joseph of Arimathea at the time Jesus died. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. He took it down, wrapped it in linen, laid it in a tomb that was hewn out of the rock where no one had ever lain before. When was that? 
That day was the preparation day, and the Sabbath drew on. I'll need to read this, evidently. That day was the Sabbath, uh, was the preparation day, and the Sabbath drew on. Let me catch up in my Bible. And the women who'd come with him from Galilee followed after, and they observed the tomb and how his body was laid. Then they returned and prepared f- spices and fragrant oils, and they rested on the Sabbath according to the commandment. So Jesus died on one day, and the next day was the Sabbath. It says, Now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain others with them came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared, and Jesus was raised from the dead. So which day? You ask a person about the Sabbath, great idea. Ask a Christian, great idea. You want to do it God's way. What's God's way? Jesus died on Friday. He rose on Sunday. The day in between was the Sabbath. That's the day that we call Saturday. Except some will say, Sunday's my Sabbath. Well, no, you don't have a Sabbath. Neither do I. God has one. And he says it's the seventh day. We didn't create the world. We didn't rest after the creation was completed. It's like the plan of salvation. We don't modify that. We accept that. Well, or we don't. You have a choice in this. And people will say, well, I would, but, but I work. I work on that day, and I, I couldn't get that changed. Suddenly, your great big God got really, really small. This God who parted the Red Sea, who brought down the walls of Jericho, this God who brought water out of a rock, and you feel like he can't work out your work situation? No, you don't want your God to be that small. You want him to be, you want him to be big. What about my business? It's really busy. That's the busiest day of the week. I could tell you story after story of people who looked at the Bible and said the seventh day is the Sabbath, looked at their business and said this, like an emoji, like that. And then they said, let's do it God's way, and God worked it out. I've had numerous business people tell me, when I closed on the Sabbath day, I became busier than ever before, and not less busy. That's just true. Oh, but I worship God on Sunday. What can be wrong with that? God likes your worship, and he respects that you are worshiping him. But when you say, I'll give God Sunday, what you're saying is, I will worship God, but not the way he asks. He asked for the Sabbath. I'll give him something else. You don't want to do that. The Bible says we worship God in spirit and in truth in John 4, verse 24. We believe the Bible is authoritative. That's true. Now, when you look at the book of Ezekiel and you read about the wheels within the wheels, you might scratch your head. What's that? You might read a prophecy in Zechariah and say, I don't quite know what that means. But when you read, the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God, That is just as plain as can be. Nothing confusing about that, and God doesn't want you to be confused. Now, I've had this said to me. I go to church on Sunday because God changed the day. Half true. Half true. The day was changed, just not by God. Uh, People will say, Jesus rose from the dead on Sunday, but... That was never given as a reason to alter or change the Sabbath day. We're grateful for the resurrection, but the resurrection doesn't change God's law. What happened was this. Early Christians kept the seventh-day Sabbath. You read about that in the book of Acts. After Calvary and Pentecost, they were keeping the seventh-day Sabbath. Here's what happened historically. A Roman emperor whose name was Constantine converted to Christianity. And he mandated that throughout his kingdom, people would observe the pagan rest day, which was the day of the sun, Sunday. By the time the popes of Rome occupied the seat of the Caesars or the emperors, they had made that part of church law as well. And it's not like you could easily argue with the popes of Rome. This got baked in after hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. It got entrenched in Christianity. Remember, for Hundreds of years, the church was not biblical. The church openly and proudly, incorrectly, followed tradition. So when you get a Bible in your hands, you read 
the seventh day, you look at the church and say, the church is following tradition, and now you've got a question to ask yourself. Is it good enough to follow tradition? Of course it's not. Not if that tradition goes against the Bible. You're going to say, ah, but I go to the same church that my parents went to or my grandparents went to. You, you might want to ask if you are going to the church Jesus would go to. If he were alive on the earth, Jesus is our example. This doesn't require any special algorithm to figure out. For 4,000 or so years, there's been an entire race of people on the planet keeping the Sabbath. They seem to have it figured out. The Ethiopian church kept the Sabbath right down to the time of the Reformation when missionaries arrived and convinced many, but not all of them, that they were wrong. They weren't. They were right. The Bible shows things clearly to us, and we can be clear. Jesus died on the preparation day, rose on the first day, the day in between, Sunday. Look at this with me. It's Mark 5 and verse 17. It says, Jesus speaking, Do not think that I have come to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy but to fulfill. For assuredly, I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all be fulfilled. The Sabbath stretches from Friday at sunset through to Saturday at sunset. In the winter, it's a little earlier. In the summer, it's a little later. And I'm wanting you to think more than just the, the legalese of this and into the experience of this. This stretches into eternity. Isaiah wrote these words in Isaiah chapter 66. For as the new heavens and the new earth which I will make shall remain before me, says the Lord, so shall your descendants and your name remain. It will come to pass that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another, all flesh shall come and worship before me, says the Lord. Now, keep this in mind. You don't want to merely be right. Because the truth is, you can be right and be wrong. The truth should have a sanctifying experience in your life. When you come to Jesus, you ought to be growing in Jesus and becoming more like Jesus. When God enters your life, Christ enters your heart and writes his word in your heart. He remakes your mind. Did you know your mind is literally shaped? Now, I don't use that word literally symbolically. Literally shaped or sculpted by what you feed your mind with. Now, did you know that your brain is plastic? Now, you might be thinking, I know some people whose brains are plastic or mush or concrete or something. That's not what I mean. Plastic, as in moldable, shapeable. Your brain has this remarkable capacity to change with your environment by forming new neural connections. The term is neuroplasticity. This is what allows some people to recover after a traumatic brain disease. I met a woman recently, lovely to meet her and her husband, and then I met a relative of hers and she said, oh yes, she had a terrible brain injury, couldn't walk, couldn't speak. How in the world? Well, that's neuroplasticity, which allows your brain to rewire itself in certain circumstances. It is known that stress can change not only the function of the brain, but it can change the structure of the brain itself. So what you want is for God to rewire you, remake your mind. And the Sabbath suggests that God can and will do that. Let me broaden this just a little bit. I said I would come back and speak about something. I'll do that right now. There's a great temptation to make a real mistake, no matter what your background or belief or affiliation or whatever. And that is that you feel like somehow you're going to be saved by the facts. Yeah, but facts don't change you. Only Jesus changes you. And what you want to be doing is feeding on the Word of God on a daily basis. We're talking about the seventh day being the Sabbath. That's right. 
But you ought to be connecting with God every day. Don't take a day out. Don't switch off. You don't go to church on whatever day you think is right and then say, that's me for the week. What you have the opportunity to do is to come to God and grow and feed and expand your understanding of God and receive more of God so that you become a living, breathing Christian, not just somebody who only knows the facts. You want to know the Savior. We know what some of the facts are. Ten Commandments, 12 Disciples, 40 Days and 40 Nights, Five Loaves and Two Fish, Three Days and Three Nights, 30 Pieces of Silver. We understand that. But you can go beyond that and experience Jesus on a devotional level. The Sabbath helps you with that. Why? Because the Sabbath is a memorial of God's creative power. Not just His ability to create but his ability to recreate. This is the genius of the Sabbath, I think. It says God can remake you. God can rewire you. God can reform you. It's, it's God who can forgive your sins. How does he do that? He can because he's the creator. God gives you a new heart. He can because he's the creator. And entering into a Sabbath relationship with God says, God, I'm recognizing you are the creator, and I'm giving you permission and authority to be my recreator completely. David prayed, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Evolution has nothing to do with the Christian experience. David didn't say, I need to evolve into a better being. He said, I need to be recreated, and only God can do that work. He will remake you in the image of God. What sin has destroyed, God can restore. What death takes away, God can give back. It is God's purpose that you be grounded in life. That's the will of God for you. Now, can you take God at his word? I wonder if you can. It's easy to put your hand up in the air and say, I'm a Christian, I believe God, I believe the Bible. And God says, I want to take you a little higher. I'll share an analogy with you. A few years ago in a football game, the game was decided on a kick that no one's really sure whether it went over or not because it went higher than the upright. The kick was awarded as though it was over. That meant one team went further into the playoffs and another team was eliminated. It was a bit of a thing if you were involved in any of that. So the NFL decided they would make the bars higher. It was only five or so feet. They figured that would help. We'll make the uprights higher. What for? So that we can see with greater clarity how things really are. Now, many people are very happy to track along as Christians until they perceive God just made the uprights higher. And he's asking a little more. Why does he do that? He doesn't do it to make things more difficult. He, makes it, he does it to clarify your experience. Christianity has a lot more to do. With, there's more to Christianity than what comes out of your mouth. You can say anything. But God wants it to be demonstrated in your life that you are a living, breathing Christian. And he'll bring challenges to you sometimes. Sometimes they are circumstances where your fur gets ruffled a little bit and how do you respond? That demonstrates the depth of your Christian experience. And then there are times that God says, I'd like you to go a little higher, a little further, a little deeper. I didn't know about the seventh day Sabbath. God says, see, I got a blessing for you. He's bringing light to your life. And when he does that, there's an opportunity for you to respond one way or another. You might say yes. That would say, I'm following Jesus. You might say, no, I don't know what that says. I'll leave it for you to figure that out. Now, there's a third option. That option is, I don't think I understand. Maybe I need more information. Maybe I need to think and study and pray. And that's reasonable. If you're open to God's leading, you're open to God's blessing. Think a day off a week. You could say, that's a selfish thing and I gained that way. And you do. 
But you could also say, I think a little more spiritually, God has a blessing for me. He wants to spend time with me. He wants me just to push aside the things of the week and the things of work and all that secular stuff and welcome Jesus more into my life. Imagine, i got a day a week to spend with God. When the sun sets on Friday evening, I don't have to worry about all those other weekly concerns. This is like an oasis in time. It's holy ground. God says we can spend that time together. It's time for worship. You've got time for church. You've got time to fellowship. You've got time to be with Christian believers who can encourage you and whom you can courage, encourage. It's a time for service. You may want to be a little careful about that. But this is the day that you can say, let's invest in somebody else. Let's visit. Let's build up. Let's encourage. Let's serve Jesus. It's a time to grow yourself spiritually. There is time to read your Bible. There is time to pray. There is time to worship. There is time to praise. God knew what he was doing right back there at the beginning. Six days of creation. You would logically expect that on day seven, God would have said to Adam and Eve, let's go. But maybe that's what he said. But instead of let's go, let's rest. After six days of creation, God said, here's the cherry on the top. This is the icing on the cake. This is when it gets really good. If you've not heard of the seven-day Sabbath, God is offering this to you as a gift, as a sign of his creative power and his recreative power. If you have heard about the seven-day Sabbath and you've been wondering, it might be time to, it's time to take it seriously. You know that Jesus is coming back soon. And the Bible speaks about the saved people when Jesus comes back, when it says this, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. If this is something that's old hat to you, do ask yourself if it's a blessing, if it's what God wants it to be, or if it's just become humdrum, mundane, routine. You're one of those people who start watching the clock, hoping the sun will set so you can get on with the good stuff. I was walking one day with a friend, an African guy. We were walking at the time along a gravel road. It was Saturday evening. I'm guessing it was around 6.30. I was walking, and he was no longer with me. He had stopped. I noticed, and I turned back. He was waving to the horizon. I wondered what he was doing. And I heard him say, Farewell, beautiful Sabbath. I thought, oh, he understands. And he was looking to that next Sabbath day. He would keep in touch with God during the week. But on that next Sabbath, he knew this was time for him and God. The other stuff doesn't get to intrude. It doesn't need to separate me from God at all. In the beginning, God created. On that seventh day, he rested and he says to you and me remember remember the sabbath day to keep it holy it was made for the human family a gift given by god and now god speaks and says in preparation for eternity as a sign of that unbroken communion you are going to have with god throughout the ceaseless ages of forever take this gift god says accept it into your heart apply it into your life remember the sabbath day Keep it holy and be grounded in life. Time to be blessed. Time to be blessed by beautiful music. This is Marion Peppers. Listen. Peace when 
Thank you, Mary and Pippus. I wonder if Jesus is your peace today. Give you an opportunity to settle that in your heart. When you came in here, here in Knoxville, you were given a card. Would you take that out? And I'd like you to have a card as well. Uh, I'll send you one right now via the miracle of technology. Why don't you send me a text message to 71392. That's my number, 71392. Send me the word peace, just a one word message, peace. And I'll send you a link right back. You click on that link and you'll have an opportunity to make a decision for Jesus right now. So let's look at our card. And I do hope you have one. If you have one, don't just file it away or stick it in your Bible or write in the seat in front of you. We read, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. That's from Acts 16 and verse 31. And I have five statements here. And God will speak to your heart about how you relate to each one of those. Number one says, I believe and accept that Jesus loves me and has redeemed me. I yield and rededicate my life to him today. Now that's something you might have probably wanted to have done already today. But even if you have, do it again. Tell God right now. I yield my life to you and I rededicate my life to you or dedicate my life to you. And I've mentioned to you before already, this is one that most people miss. They might get about their life as Christians on some level, but they haven't chosen to yield to surrender their life to God. You want to do that now. Let's look at number two. I believe the truth presented today is important to Jesus and by faith, I ask him to make it grounded and real in my daily life. Now, that's the work of God. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. You hear, you open your heart, and it is God who takes his word and writes it in your heart. And that's the prayer you are praying here, and you're acknowledging that. I would encourage you to check number two. Remember, if you're watching from afar, I'd love for you to fill out a card as well. Text me at 71392. Text me the word peace and I'll send you a card click the link and you make a decision for Jesus today as well number three I have questions about this topic and I would like additional information this might be a subject where you have questions you want to be grounded in life you want to say Lord show me more if this is from you I want to really understand this we'll get additional information to you number four I have obstacles in my life and I request prayer and or I request to visit with a pastor. That's number four. And point number five, I would like to be baptized or rebaptized. I would like to connect with a pastor. Is God calling you to give your life to him or give your life back? If that's you, then check number five and do write your contact details. I'll say again, if you're watching from afar, 
71392. Text me there. Send me a one-word message. Peace. And don't send me a message that says, Peace, thank you, or peace, praise the Lord. Just peace. That's polite enough. And we'll send you a link. You click on that link right there. Now, we're going to go through this card again, but I want to remind you, we're not done. Things are just getting started. Right after we're done, if you are at itiswritten.tv, you'll carry on with the study, the important study session with Pastor Wes Peppers and Pastor Eric Flickinger. That's when it gets really good. We take the It Is Written Bible Study Guide and we start digging in and digging deeper and answering some of those questions you've had in your mind and we'll flesh out some of those subjects that we maybe not have maybe have not fleshed out yet. So that's in just a moment. You go to, if you're not there already, go to itiswritten.tv and you'll find Eric and Wes there in a moment. Let's read through our card again. Number one, I believe and accept that Jesus loves me. He has redeemed me. I yield and I rededicate my life to him today. Every day, an opportunity to give your life, rededicate your life to God. We're giving you that opportunity right now. Number two, I believe that what is being presented today, the truth presented today, is important to Jesus. Sure it is. He created the seventh-day Sabbath. And so by faith, I ask him to make it grounded and real in my daily life. Wouldn't you want to spend that day with God? And you know what's interesting? More people than you might even have realized are considering and wrestling with this subject. They've read the Bible. They've read where it says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. They've counted from one through seven. They realize that the day we call Saturday is the Sabbath of the Bible. And people are wondering. I think they're waiting to know. And now, at least some, no. Questions have been answered. There is clarity now. And you check number two. You're asking God to make this grounded and to make this real in your life. You may have questions about that topic, this topic. And if you do, we welcome your questions. Let us know and we can share with you additional information. That's number three. Number four, I have obstacles in my life. I request prayer or and or a visit from a pastor. So let us know if that's your desire. And then number five, I would like to be baptized or rebaptized and would like to connect with a pastor. Then write your details there clearly. We want to encourage you to be grounded. Thanks for being with us. We're not over yet. The Bible study is still to come. This is Grounded, brought to you by It Is Written. Thank you for remembering that It Is Written exists because of the kindness of people just like you. To support this international life-changing ministry, please call us now at 800-253-3000. You can send your tax-deductible gift to the address on your screen, or you can visit us online at itiswritten.com. Thank you for your prayers and for your financial support. Our number again is 800-253-3000. You could visit us online at itiswritten.com. You know that at It Is Written, we are serious about the study of the Word of God, and we encourage you to be serious about God's Word also. Well, I want to share with you another way that you can dig deeper into the Word of God, and here it is. It is written dot study. Go online to itiswritten.study and you can access the It Is Written Bible Study Guides, 25 in-depth Bible studies that will walk you through the Bible. It's going to be good for you, and it's the sort of thing that you will want to tell somebody else about so that they can dig deeper into the Word of God and come to know the things of the Bible intimately. As you get into the It Is Written Online Bible Study Guides, you'll understand the prophecies of the Bible, the plan of salvation, and more. So don't forget, it is written dot study. It is written dot study.
Welcome back to our Grounded Study Session. We're so glad that you've, joined, that you've joined us wherever you're watching around the world. My name is Pastor Wes Peppers, and this is Pastor Eric Flickinger. Pastor Eric, always good to see you. It's good to be here again, Eric Wes. is our associate speaker at It Is Written, and we're just delighted to be able to come together and study the Bible on this exciting subject that Pastor John just covered in the main session. We're live here in Knoxville, and wherever you are, thank you for being with us. Just a couple of things before we get started. We just want to remind you that you can go to grounded.study and Eric, they're going to find something there that they can access. What That's is that? Right. Uh, every time we have one of our presentations, we have another free gift that we are giving away. And this morning's free gift is a copy of the book, God's Eternal Sign. God's Eternal Sign. If you want to get a free copy of that book, just go to grounded.study register there and tomorrow you will receive an email that has this as an attachment and it will be an incredible blessing to you again grounded.study you can also go to youtube and access the previous programs that we've done over the course of grounded and so we encourage you to do that and we also encourage you to share those with your friends Wherever they are, just copy the link, paste it, send it in a text message or post it on Facebook, and that others will be able to be blessed by Grounded. It's been an exciting series, hasn't it? It really has. We're almost done, but not quite. We're almost done, but not quite. It's a shorter series, but we're going to continue to press on. Before we get into our lesson, we also want to remind you of our flagship website, itiswritten.com. There's a number of resources there. There's different things that you can access, and it'll be a great blessing to you. And so go to itiswritten.com, and you can have access to a number of our other components, uh, such as the mission trips, and It Is Written TV, and a number of other things. So thank you for doing that today. All right, Eric, we are going to be jumping into lesson number seven in our It Is Written study guide series, and it is entitled Quality Time. And we're going to just, just go a little bit deeper into the subject that, of the Sabbath that Pastor John covered. And I'm excited about this one because there's a lot of stuff that I think people haven't really thought about that we're going to bring out. That's right. So if you have a study guide, fantastic. If not, you can follow along and make sure that you grab the study guides afterwards so that you can, uh, can get the most out of our study. All right. So we're going to jump right into it. And once again, we're not going to cover every question in the lesson, but we are going to share some supplemental material with you so you'll be able to follow along and then just listen and write down the texts that are not in the lesson and go back and study them for yourselves. We're going to jump into question number one, and it says, has God demonstrated that he wants to spend time with his children? I don't know about you, but I like spending time with my kids. Absolutely. It's always a blessing. It's always a joy. But let's see what the Bible says in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. You want to read that for us? Here's what Jesus says. He says, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Eric, what kind of rest is Jesus looking to give us? Jesus wants to give us all kinds of rest. He wants to give us physical rest. He wants to give us spiritual rest. He wants to give us a rest from the cares and the trials of our lives. So in order to have that rest, we need to spend that time with him. Does he know that we need that rest? And that's probably why he created it, yeah? I think God probably knows even better than we do that we need that rest. Sometimes we think we can just keep pushing on and on and on. And God says, no, you need to take a break. You need to recharge. You need to step back. You need to connect with me and connect with your family. And so he gives us this opportunity. That's right. You know, sometimes I'll say to my kids, I need you to do this or I want you to do this. And my son is old enough now, he'll just look at me and say, I don't see you doing that, right? So God, but God is, is, is very different, at least, well, I sometimes tell him, you don't see me doing it, but I do do it, right? And God is the same. He doesn't just tell us to rest, but he actually sets the example himself. The Bible says that God rested on the Sabbath day as well. And so uh, it's a good reminder to us that God is always doing that which he asks us to do and being that which he asked us to be well, let's jump to number two it says what special gift did god give the human family to ensure that we would have regular time with him he wants that regular time and we know the answer to this it says in genesis 2 verses 2 and 3 and on the seventh day god ended his work which he had done and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done 
Now this is a very powerful thing. Well, let's keep reading the text there. He then continues. He says, Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because in it He rested from all His work which God had created and made. So He blessed it. He rested, rested on it. And He sanctified it. What does it, it mean that He sanctified it? The word it? sanctify means to set apart for a holy use. So all the way back at the book of Genesis, all the way back at the end of creation week, God set this day apart for a holy use. He says, this is a special day. This is a day unlike the others. Six days you, re you work, one day you rest, and this rest day is to be spent with me to give you encouragement, to give you strength, to give you vitality. So he gives us this day, he sets it aside for us. Now there's a lot of people that think, Eric, that God, that, that the Sabbath was kind of a product of sin, that God gave the Sabbath after sin occurred in the earth but what you find in the book of genesis is that god gave sabbath in a perfect world it was established before sin entered the world so if sin had never entered the world and we were still living in a perfect world what would we be doing we'd still have the sabbath we'd still have the sabbath so it was needed even in a world where people don't get tired that's right if you stop and think about it there are at least two things that god instituted here on planet earth before sin entered the picture one of them is the sabbath and the other one is marriage and the devil knows that if he can destroy relationships both of those are about relationships you need time spent with someone to have a good relationship with them and so god wants to spend that time that sabbath with you and to have a good marriage you need to spend time with your spouse so the devil has worked hard to destroy both of those uh, but especially today, we're talking about the Sabbath and that relationship that we find there. So what we find the Sabbath to be is less about just the right day or the wrong day, even though there is a right day. Yet it's about relationship. It's about grace. It's about faith. It's about personal interaction with the God who made us and understanding more deeply his creative power. And that's, I believe, a very powerful thing. Now, if you Take a look at, the, I have a little chart here that's, I think, very powerful. You look at creation and you find a pattern here that every time God would create something, he would then fill it. So on the first day, he created light and then he filled the, in the heavens and, he, and the second day, the heavens, and then he filled it with the birds of the air. On the third day, he created the sea and the earth and on the fifth and sixth day, he filled it with the fish of the sea and the animals of the earth. So every day, God would create something, and then he would fill it. He would create something, and then he would fill it. Well, the Bible tells us that on the sixth day, God created man in his image, man and woman, in the likeness of both, he created them in his image. And what then did God fill man with? on the sabbath on the seventh day god filled man with his presence so this is a beautiful gift that god has given to us and we get to experience this on the sabbath that's right it's a powerful concept and it's much more again than just a do or a don't it's a let's be together with him let's experience his presence in our hearts and in our lives well, let's jump to question number three now was the sabbath day only for the jews to keep and I think we know the answer to that, and that comes from Mark chapter 2, verse 27. Mark 2, 27, it says, And Jesus said to them, The Sabbath was made for what? M-A-N. Isn't that a funny way to spell Jew? He doesn't say that, does he? He says the Sabbath was made for what? For man, for humankind, for mankind, and not man for the Sabbath. So the Sabbath was a love gift of God to humanity, for our blessings so that we could have that relationship with him and i think it's powerful the greek word when it says man there is the word anthropos which is where we get the word anthropology which is the study of mankind now here's what i love about the sabbath when god says the sabbath was made for man he's also stating something else that when it's made for you it is not against you but it truly is for you how many could say amen to that? It's created for our help. It's created for our blessing. And when we rest on the Sabbath, really what we're doing is we're just resting in the promises that God has already given to us. Amen? And that's the joy of rest on the Sabbath. And that's why it's so important 
to take advantage of it. People say, well, you know, I feel kind of restricted on the Sabbath. You know, I, 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 I feel like I can't do this and I can't do that. Is it true that God has those things? There are some things that He tells us He doesn't want us to do, but why does He want, want us to not do those things? Do you think He's trying to keep good things from us? See, here's the problem. Sometimes we trade in the best things for good things in return, and that's a bad deal. We want to get the best things, and that's what God offers us in the Sabbath is the best things. That's right, and, and I think what's powerful here is just very simply that when, when we consider the Sabbath and when we consider what's best, and that's what God gives us, we cannot add anything to that of ourselves. You understand what I'm saying? We cannot add to that of our own value. So when, when God says, I want you to not do this, it's because whatever that thing is, it may not even be bad, but it's not ideal and it's not going to allow us to experience the fullness of everything that God has for us, you see. It detracts from that. And so that's why God says, hey, maybe this isn't the best idea because I want you to gain the greatest blessing. Now, if we take what we want to add on the Sabbath or what we want to do in the Sabbath and compare it to what God has for us on the Sabbath, which one do you think is better? Which one? God's, absolutely. Now, we have to demonstrate that by the choices we make and by the faith that we exercise. But God has something special for us that's better than we can add for ourselves. And all He's doing is saying, I'm inviting you to choose that better thing. I'm inviting you to do what I have for you. And as you exercise faith and do that thing, you're going to find that it is better. That's right. And keep in mind, God knows better what's good for us than we do. How many of you at some point in your life have thought that a decision would be good for you and you found out later it wasn't such a good idea? All right, here's the thing. God never makes that mistake. He always knows what's best for us. And he gives us the opportunity to be a part of his plan for our lives. And we just have to accept that and receive it with gratefulness. And we get to ride on the high places of the earth. And you know what the good news is about humans, Eric? Is that when we do that thing that we realize later wasn't the best idea, we never do that again. We never make another wrong choice that isn't the best idea, do we? Or do we? We can be right back at that same thing the next time. And really what the gospel is, is it's God's invitation for us to say, I'm going to choose the better. I'm going to choose God's way instead of my own way. And that's really what the whole struggle of the great controversy is all about, choosing Him rather than ourselves. All right, let's keep going here. Question number four, how important is the Sabbath in the eyes of God? How important is that? Very simple, God tells us, very clearly from Exodus how important that is. He says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. So he wants us to remember that day. It's interesting when you take a look at the Ten Commandments, the fourth commandment, as you well know, is the longest of the ten, and it's the only one that begins with the word what? Remember. So God wants us to remember this. He says, don't forget it. Don't let it go by the wayside. It's important. I want you to keep it in the forefront of your mind. Now, was the Sabbath supposed to be joyous? It is supposed to be joyous. It shouldn't be a bunch of thou shalt not. What are some things that we get to do on the Sabbath? We get to spend time with God. We get to spend time in His Word. We get to spend time with family. We get to spend time with like-minded believers. We get to spend time ministering to others. We get to put aside the cares and the worries of the week. We get to rest. So the Sabbath is about a whole bunch of we get to's and not a bunch of we don't get to's. That's right. And the day is holy. It doesn't say it's a holiday. It's a holy day. Amen. And so we want to remember that. But just because it's a holy day doesn't mean it's not a joyous day. It is a joyous day. And when we abide in Jesus on that day, the beautiful thing is that Jesus comes to us on the Sabbath. Amen. He brings His presence to us. He brings His presence to us every day, but on the Sabbath day, it's a time when God's people gather together. It's a time when we have to, to come as a church family and experience the blessing of that gathering. And you know, a lot of people say, well, I just can keep the Sabbath on my own. And true, there, are, there is a blessing that you get by being by yourself on that day, 
But there's a blessing that you can't get by yourself when you come together with other believers. And that's why it's important to draw near. And so we are going to gain something extra special, more than we can attain ourselves when we follow God's counsel. That's right. Another point to remember is it's not just about what you think you need or what we think we need. God may want to use you to be a blessing to someone else on that day. Somebody may be coming to church hoping and praying that something will happen in their life, that somebody will say something that will encourage them and lift them out of a pit. And God might want to use you to be that person, to be that blessing to someone else, to encourage them, to speak that word to them that will lift them out of that pit. But if you stay at home, you may be depriving someone else of that blessing. And I don't say that to be a guilt trip. It's just an opportunity that God may want to use to be a blessing to someone else. God is all about giving us opportunities. He's a God of choice. He's a God of freedom. He's a God that allows us to decide for ourselves. But he says, if you want the very best thing, here it is. It's me. It's what I'm offering you. And but you, I give you the choice to, to choose that or to reject it. And uh, we do that every day. We have those choices every day. Well, let's go to our next question now, number five. How is the Sabbath day important in our daily experience with God? I, I really like this one, and it's found in Exodus 20, verse 11. It says, For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Now, this is exciting because it demonstrates the idea of God as the creator. And why is that so important in our, cre in our salvation experience even? Is it, does that mean that we're saved by keeping the Sabbath? No. Eric, what does it mean? It gives us an opportunity to reflect on why we're even here. Because much of the world today doesn't, doesn't operate on the mindset or the worldview of creationism. It's more evolution. And so in the evolutionary mindset, we kind of evolved from, well, I guess ultimately a puddle of goo to where we are today. And when we die, that's kind of it. And life really doesn't have much purpose, if you want to use that word, with that mindset. But when we remember that we are created in the image of God and that he wants to recreate his image in us so that other people can see God through their interactions with us, that gives us a purpose. It gives us a wonderful uh, wonderful hope to look forward to as well because the plan of salvation is real but we have to remember that we are created all the way back at creation when God worked for six days he took that seventh day and he said I want to have this relationship with you remember the fact that you're created remember that you are made in the image of God remember that I want to spend time with you that's right and the same power when God said in Genesis let there be light when he said, let there be a firmament, when he said, let there be vegetation, let there be animals, and, and so forth. The same power that God used at creation is the same power that recreates our hearts. You understand that? And it's very important for us to grasp and believe God's creative power and that his word is also creative. Because when, that, when we understand that, and when we believe that God, that's the, the, the sixth literal day creation is so important because if we don't believe that it's possible for God to do that, then we most likely won't believe that when God speaks a word of forgiveness or he says, you're a new creature in Christ. When the Bible says that, we're less likely to believe it. Does that make sense? It's so critical that we believe and understand the process of creation because the same power is at work in our lives when God saves us. It's creative power. And when God speaks a word, be clean, we truly are clean. And the Sabbath is like the crowning acknowledgement of that. When Jesus created the world, when God created the world through Christ, and we read about that in Colossians 1 and so forth, Christ's creative power demonstrates His divinity. See? So when Jesus said the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath day, what's he really saying? I am the Creator. That's what he was saying. And not only was I the Creator of the world, but I was the Creator of you, and I can be the Recreator of your heart. 
And so you see the Sabbath, it's not that the Sabbath is salvation, it's not that it saves us, but it demonstrates the power of the gospel because as I keep the Sabbath, I'm acknowledging that Jesus is the creator of this world and he is the recreator of my heart and I'm a new creature in him because of his power to take my heart of sin and give it a new birth, to take this heart of stone and give me a heart of flesh. Absolutely. So, so many blessings in the Sabbath and so many things that we can reflect on that show God's grace and mercy and his desire for our lives. And that's the power of nature as well, because when I get out in nature on the Sabbath, when I see the creation that he's made, it reminds me that the same power that created that is at work in my life right now. It's bringing me closer to Jesus. It's making me more like Him. It's creating, recreating in me the image of Jesus and the image of God. And that's a powerful thought. And that's why the Sabbath is so very important. And it's so very important to acknowledge it, to accept it, and to honor it in the way that God has prescribed for us without adding our own element to it, our own desires to it, but just in the way that He has given it to us which is a beautiful grace. Number six, what else does the Sabbath tell us about our relationship with God? Eric, Ezekiel 20, verse 12. In Ezekiel 20, 12, it says, Moreover, I also gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between them and me that they might know that I am the Lord who sanctifies them. So God has given us the Sabbath as a sign. You might even say a seal that he has given us to help us remember that he's the one who sanctifies us. We cannot sanctify ourselves. We cannot make ourselves holy. We cannot make ourselves perfect, but he wants to do that work in us. So that word sanctify is a salvation word. Yes, it is. It, it, justification, sanctification, glorification. Notice God doesn't say that the Sabbath sanctifies you. So, so we're not looking at salvation by sabbath keeping but he says that the sabbath is a sign that i am sanctifying you does that make sense i recreated your heart to make it new again when i forgave you that's why in the ten commandments uh in the very beginning of the ten commandments and i actually have a slide on this i might be here nope it's not there it's coming up but god says i am the lord your god who delivered you out of bondage so he says, I recreated your heart, and as a sign to the world that I've done that, I want you to keep the Sabbath. And when you keep the Sabbath, it's a symbol to the world that I'm doing a work of creation in your life. I'm doing a work of recreation for your heart, and you're acknowledging that by honoring me on that day. Isn't that powerful? How do you think that's powerful? It's a beautiful thing. Now, let's read this next text. Uh, we're going to look at Hebrews because I think that some people say, well, that's Old Testament and keeping the Sabbath means you're attempting to be saved by works. And really <clears throat> what we're finding is that's not the case at all. Absolutely not the case. Here's what the author of Hebrews says in Hebrews 4 verses 3 and 4. For we who have believed do enter that rest. For he has spoken in a certain place of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. All right, so I want us to, we're going to set just a little context here. The rest that the author is speaking of there in that beginning part of that chapter is not the Sabbath rest, but it's salvational rest. And where do we find salvational rest? In Jesus, and in Jesus alone, by faith alone. In him alone yes and that's where we find the spiritual rest that Jesus talks about but later in the chapter as he describes it you have to go back and read the whole chapter but he says there remains therefore a rest for the people of God when he says that word rest in that context the word for rest there is the word sabbatismos and what does that mean that's, Eric that's Sabbath it means Sabbath rest now this is very interesting because it then says, for he who has entered his rest, talking about salvation, now watch what it says, has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. Well, the question is, how did God cease from his works? Well, we read up in verse 4 that God rested when? On the seventh day. So let, let's put this in layman's terms. 
And it's this simple. The author is saying that when you find rest in Jesus, salvationally speaking, the natural result with a renewed heart, God writes His law on our hearts and He puts it on our minds. And we're going to, as Christ lives in us, begin shaping, He's going to shape our lives to live that way. Does that make sense? So when I keep the Sabbath, this is very powerful, and don't miss this point at all. Very powerful, especially our friends watching online. When I keep the Sabbath, or when God keeps the Sabbath through me and I'm resting, and I'm ceasing from my work on that day, I'm telling the world I cannot be saved by my works. I can only be saved through the righteousness of Christ. That's why it is a sign. That's right. If you think about all the Ten Commandments, most of the Ten Commandments make logical sense to most people. Thou shalt not kill. We get that. It's wrong to kill. Uh, don't bear false witness. We, we know it's wrong to lie. We shouldn't lie. Uh, don't commit adultery. Of course not. That damages families. And you go down through the Ten Commandments, nine of them make perfect logical sense. One of them doesn't. It's the fourth commandment where God says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And we go, well, what's the big deal? What's one day different than another day? This is where we trust him. We say, I don't understand why it's that important. He gives us some indications. We've been talking about them right now. But to a logical mind who doesn't understand, it doesn't make much sense. Why one day instead of another? What's the difference? It's only because God said. So this is where we trust him. We don't trust ourselves and we rest in that relationship we have with him. That's right. It's very powerful. And so really, rather than the Sabbath being an attempt to be saved by works, it's really a testimony of grace. Amen? It's really a testimony of God's power and his beauty and his character and his love for us. And I tell the world, I'm not being saved by works today. I'm being saved by the grace of God. And as an evidence of that in my life, I'm going to cease from my normal labor. That's why we don't work on the Sabbath. Amen? And because we're testifying of God's goodness in our lives. Well, Jesus worked seven miracles on the Sabbath, and we have just a minute. Uh, we want to encourage you to go through those. And basically, those are very powerful because it is a demonstration of God's power to deliver from sin. Every time Jesus healed someone on the Sabbath, he was simply saying, I also have the power to set you free from sin. Amen. And that's the beauty of the Sabbath. It's another testimony of God's delivering power. That's right. And if Jesus can deliver people in Bible times from their infirmities, from their sins, how many of you believe he can deliver us as well? He can deliver Absolutely, us. he can. Amen. So really, the Sabbath is all about freedom. Amen? And when God invites us to refrain from our work on that day, he's setting us free from the craziness of life. He's setting us free. And He's a reminder to us that He's setting us free ultimately from sin. Amen? And we're thankful for that today. Are you thankful for that today? We want to thank you all for joining us here for our study session at Grounded. And we look forward to next time on Grounded, hosted by It Is Written.